Hello, my name is David Hicks. Welcome to the I'm Excited podcast. Thank you for joining me. Whether you're watching on YouTube, whether you're listening, it doesn't matter. I greatly appreciate it. Today's topic, we are going to try and summarize Christianity. We're going to talk, try and talk about what happens in the Bible. What's the Bible all about? What's, in other words, what's the big story, the big picture of God and Jesus and us? And so that's what I want to cover in just a moment here. But if you're watching on YouTube, you do see that I'm wearing a pray hashtag pray for J t-shirt that stands for Jackson. I go, he's 20 years old. He suffers from Crohn's disease. He had a surgery recently that was by all accounts of the surgeons, very successful. However, there's been a lot of post-surgery complications. And so please, if you could pray for him, his mother, uh, Elizabeth, his dad, Josh, his sister, Morgan, he would be greatly appreciated. And please, I encourage you in that prayer. Yes, pray for Jackson's physical healing, but most of all, pray for his faith and the faith of all his family, their, their hope, their peace, their joy, their love, because that's what's truly under attack here. What Satan, God's enemy, I'll talk about him later, is shooting for is the destruction of their faith and their love and their hope, their peace, their joy. And so please, um, by all means, inc include that when you pray for them, if you, if you do so. And if you have, thank you so much on behalf of the family. All right, so let's get into it. What happened? The Bible is a huge book, okay? And side note, this isn't one novel written by one person. This is a collection of writings written across a span of hundreds of years, meticulously copied by people who recognize them, that they came from God, that God inspired these, and they're, they're trustworthy. And so what is, when you tie all these different writings together, what's the gist of it? And, and the gist of it is this. It starts out this way. God creates the universe. The sun, the moon, the stars. He creates the sky. He creates the earth and everything in it. That includes us. He made man and woman in his own image. Now, what, what does that mean, in his own image? Well, fortunately, in, in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 4, Four, the Genesis is the first writing, the first book of this collection, if you will. Uh, it talks about maybe chapter four or five. I don't, I don't remember. Sorry. It talks about how Adam, the very first man, had a son in his own image. In other words, when Adam had a son, he didn't look like a tree, didn't look like a lion or a bush or a boulder. He looked like Adam, hands, arms, face, ears, eyes, etc. He looked like a human being. And so when God created us in his own image, A, we reflect a lot of the same traits that God has. The Bible, you know, in these writings talks about God's eyes, ears, his hands, his feet, etc., and so we bear his image. But this also helps us understand that God created us as his children. We are his sons. We are his daughters. And so we were made in his image. We were made as his children. Now, here's a little bit of a side note for you, because you may have been told that you know, God doesn't want to hear your prayers. God doesn't want you to talk to him. That is a privilege reserved for people who are holy enough to talk to him. And, and that is not just, it's absolutely not true. Okay. Uh, that teaching may have come from, you know, I don't know about the heart of the people who ever came up with that theory. Okay. So I'm not going to judge their heart, but the thing is, you're his sons and you are his daughters. Every father who loves their children wants their children to talk to them. He wants to have a relationship with those children. And so if, you know, even if your prayer to God is, hey, Father, if you really are there, God, if you really do exist, wonderful, start there. He has his ways of showing you that he really does exist that he really is there and that he really is listening. Just 
don't go before him in a spirit of pride, in a spirit of arrogance, in a spirit of, hey, I'm better than all these other people around me. So you you should listen to me, God. You know, that's, you know, that's the one thing he, that's the one major thing, maybe two major things, but that he can't stand. And that's one of them. Regardless, just come before him in a spirit of humility and he will listen. All right, but let's keep going. So God gave us, gave mankind from the very beginning, an environment of freedom. What do I mean by that? The first, the first man and woman were Adam and Eve, very unique people because they were old enough in body to be husband and wife, but they ran around naked like they were two-year-olds. They had no shame. I mean, God himself would appear in the garden and they wouldn't think anything about being unclothed. They had an innocence about them, the same kind of innocence that little children have. And yet, even then, God gave them a choice to obey or not to obey. He created one tree in the garden. It was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what that tree would do if you ate its fruit would... would it would rob you of your innocence. And so he told them, don't eat from that tree. Don't touch that tree. If you do, you will die. And so Adam and Eve eventually, instead of following God's ways, decided to follow their own ways and their own desires. And they took fruit from that tree and they ate it. And immediately, boom, they lost their innocence. One of the things that happened was as they had children and those children grew up, those children did not grow up to be innocent like Adam and Eve were when they were first created. They had a sense of right and wrong about them. And unfortunately, with this, uh, with our lost innocence and with this sense of good and evil that we have, the, the writings of Scripture tell us that we all do wrong. Excuse me, we all choose to do things that are against God. We all choose to sin, in other words. Whether we're talking about failing to do things that God tells us to do or doing things that God said don't do, we all do wrong. We all sin. And so this sin that we do merits punishment. We earn punishment through our disobedience. And there will be a, a, a time of punishment. There will be a day of judgment. There's going to be a resurrection, okay? There's going to be a last day, if you will, where God says, okay, ball game, enough, stop. Everything stops here. God's going to bring this phase of life to an end. And everyone who has ever lived is going to, you know, if they've died, will rise from the dead. Everyone who has ever lived, if you're living at the time that God says, okay, stop, this is it, no more, we're all going to be judged. And so far, looking at this story, that means we're all going to be punished. And the punishment that is awaiting us is I'm just trying to be honest with you here. It's terrifying, okay? God has created this place that we call hell. It's described as a place of fire and burning sulfur. It was designed for God's enemy, the devil, Satan, and the angels who chose to follow him as opposed to following God. And, and by the way, you may have this picture of Satan, this understanding of the devil, that he's like the king of hell. He just, just gets to sit there and just laugh at people while they get tortured. No, he's going to get tortured worse than anyone else. That's what's awaiting him. But we're in huge trouble because that's the direction in which we ourselves are headed. And so we need somebody to save us. We, we need somebody to save us. And in order to escape this punishment, all right, there are four things that had to happen for us to be able to escape the, the punishment that our sins, that our wrongdoings, that, that our evil merits. One is someone had to live a life 
without doing wrong. If two thieves are arrested, one thief can't volunteer to take the punishment of the other because they both did the wrong. They both have to be punished. So if our sin, our disobedience to God merits punishment, somebody's going to have to live a life without disobeying God ever to where they don't merit punishment. They don't, they don't merit punishment. They don't earn uh, a consequence or consequences for wrong actions because they didn't do any wrong actions. So that's the first thing that has to happen. The second thing that, happen, that has to happen is that person, whoever this is, that is able to live a sinless life also has to volunteer to take our punishment for us. He, she has to volunteer to take our place. That demands love. Because, like I said, the, the punishment we're headed toward is, you know, awful doesn't do the word justice. I mean, doesn't do it justice. And so the punishment that whoever this volunteer is going, uh, is going to receive to take our place, it is also going to be of an awful, hideous, terrifying nature. And the only way somebody's going to volunteer to do that is because they deeply care for us. We matter to that person. They deeply love us. Third thing is that the one in charge, okay, has to accept the arrangement. So think of it this way. If two people go to court, they come before a judge, and one is the thief, and the other is, let's say, their mother or their dad. You know, their mother, the, the thief is found guilty, and the mom or dad might say, please let me be punished for them. You know, here's why I want to be punished in their place. Send me to jail instead of them, or whatever the punishment might be. The judge has to be willing to accept the offer. You can offer all day, but if the judge isn't willing to accept it, it's done. It's over. So in this case, God is the one in charge. God is the one in charge. And so whoever comes before God and makes this offer, God has to be willing to accept it. And then finally, the fourth thing that has to happen is the punishment has to be actually administered. We can talk about it all day, but in the end, whoever this person is, it's volunteering to take the punishment actually has to go through the pain, the suffering on our behalf. Now, fortunately, amazingly enough, out of their deep love for us, God and Jesus have already taken care of all this. That's what the main writings of Scripture are all about, that all of these happened thanks to the work of God and Jesus, the Father and the Son. That Jesus, who was living with God, who helped God create everything, all-powerful, His one unique Son, one-of-a-kind Son, okay? God sent Him to earth. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a life tempted in all the ways that were tempted, yet Jesus never chose to disobey God. So that's step one. He lived that sinless life. How did he do it? Whenever he came to a fork in the road and one path said, you know, the sign was, you know, this way to please God and the other sign said this way to not please God, he always chose the road that pleased God the Father that pleased God. That's how he did it. So, also, he was willing, okay, to take our place. He did volunteer. He could have saved himself. He didn't have to do this, but he chose to do it. He allowed mankind to torture him to death. I'll get into that in just a second. So God, before even before the beginning of time, 
God accepted this arrangement. The Father accepted this arrangement. Now, I want you to take that in for a moment because we are talking about the one unique beloved Son coming. It's, it's not a stranger that is coming up to God, someone with whom God has no emotional connection saying, I'll take their punishment. And God's like, okay, sure, you can do it. No. This is someone who means more to the Father than any other being in existence, with the possible exception of the Holy Spirit. We might have, you know, equality meaning to the Father. Coming to the Father and saying, let me be tortured to death on their behalf. I will go. I will live a life of poverty and suffering, and in the end, I will be tortured to death on their behalf. Now, I want you to imagine your own son or your own daughter in some situation where they need to save other people, but in order to be saved, they have to go through something absolutely hideous, painful, some sort of form of of torture and pain and suffering, and they come to you, and, and the only way they're going to be able to do this is if you sign off on it. You give them their permission. Would you do it? Would you do it? The Father, out of his love for us, his deep love for us, signed off on it, signed off on the plan. And so the plan was administered. They beat Jesus. They spat on Jesus. They mocked Jesus multiple times. They pulled the hair out of, you know, out out of the hair of his beard out of his face. Isaiah talks about, he, you know, he was, you couldn't even recognize him, okay? By the time they were done torturing him, he was whipped time and time again, beaten, uh, uh, scourged. They put a crown of thorns on his head and they took a rod and beat him on the head while wearing the crown of thorns. And ultimately, they crucified him. They nailed him to a cross where he hung in pain for for six hours, and then eventually he died. The punishment was administered. And so now, here's the, the, the great news about this, is that come judgment day, we don't have to be punished. Is there a catch? Yeah, there's a little bit of a catch here. Because this gift of freedom from punishment, this gift of uh, come judgment day, uh, anything and everything you've done wrong, we're tossing it out, okay? God's not doing that for just everyone. He needs to know, do you want to accept the gift of his son? Do you want to accept the work of Jesus? And he's taking the punishment for us? Or do you want to just go your own way and and choose to be punished instead? You see, and I I wrote it this way, if you're you're watching on the, for those of you who are just listening to the podcast, I wrote this one in the board. We are now being offered not only escape from punishment, but the opportunity to live forever with God and Jesus without all the sorrow, evil, pain, and death. Say, come again? See, this, this is more, th- there is more being offered on the table than just, hey, you're not going to get punished. God has decided that he is going to make everything new. The prophet Isaiah talked about this in the, in the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible. It talks about this. God is going to make everything new. And he's going to take away the sorrow, the death, the crying, the pain. It even talks about how God is going to wipe away every tear from our eyes, meaning he's going to, all this internal, emotional, spiritual pain that we carry, pain that we think will never completely go away, pain that will always be inside us. No, he's going to take that pain away. He's going to make everything new. 
And he's not just offering us, thanks to the work of Jesus, he's not just offering us, hey, you're not going to get punished. No, he's offering us eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So there's this huge offer on the table. Amazing offer on the table. They can only be there thanks to the love that God and Jesus have for us. So will you accept the offer? It's almost like sometimes you get in the mail this uh, letter saying there's a lawsuit uh, against so and so. Do you do you want to be a part of it? You qualify, so just you know just sign on the dotted line. Well, this is a little bit different. Um. This is like getting something in the mail saying, hey, you are being sued, but uh, someone's, you know, volunteered to pay your price, to pay uh, what you're being sued for. Do you want to accept it? And will you sign here? So how do we accept this offer that's on the table? Very simple. Okay. Three things. One, believe. Choose to trust God and Jesus. Choose to trust. There is a God that, who created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in it. Choose to believe that Jesus is his son. Choose to believe the testimony of eyewitnesses that saw Jesus living and breathing and dying. And something I haven't mentioned yet up until now is that he rose from the dead. Three days later, He came back to life. That's because he lived a sinless life. The thing that we earn through our sin, Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Death means separation. Ultimately, that's what our life is leading to, complete separation from the Father. But Jesus didn't sin. And so, yes, he took our punishment, but he wasn't bound by death. He never earned death. And so he came back to life, and it's an example for us of what God is going to do for all of us. It also is a testimony that there is life after death. It's also a testimony there's a judgment day actually coming. And so, because uh, because of what they've done, We just, A, need to choose to believe it. We need to choose to trust them. And then the second thing is, we need to repent. That means we need to decide to live by their ways and not our own. We need to decide to live by the ways of God and Jesus, not our own. Some of their ways, love, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Okay, the, the, the writings of Scripture are full of passages about things that God loves and things that God wants and things that God hates, and things that God can't stand and things God doesn't want. All right? And, and so he, there's no secret. You read this long enough. There, there's no secrets about what God wants, what his ways are, and what his ways are not. Now, when you, uh, side note here, when you choose to repent, when you choose to, okay, it, this is basically a fundamental change in how you, 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 you live your life, your philosophy of life. Most of us, our philosophy is, I'm just going to do what I want to do, okay? Now we're saying, I'm going to do what God wants. That doesn't mean that you cease to have desires within you that are in contrast to what God wants, That's why Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow me, they must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. So you're going to, there are going to be desires with you to which you need to say no. Deny those and follow Jesus. Do what Jesus wants. Uh, Paul in his letter to Titus said, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. In other words, again, we there are desires in this that we now, because we made this decision to repent, I'm going to do what you want, God, not what I want. 
There are desires within us. They'll still be there, but we need to learn to say no to those. So, A, believe. Two, repent. Make the choice. For now on, God, all right, I want to learn to do what you want, and I'm going to live that way. Now, we'll be perfect in it. We'll get in that in just a second. Third thing is, be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That means to be immersed in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The three is a little bit different because one and two are things you do. Three is something that is done to you. You allow it to be done to you. It's almost like the marriage ceremony. It's almost like making it, making the relationship you know, official. But it, in baptism, God does amazing things. He washes away our sins. He, we die to our old life. We were raised as new people with a new life, completely clean, forgiven, justified, etc., by the work of the Holy Spirit, kind of God and Jesus' best friend who helps them in all that they do. And, uh, and then from there, you're, you're now in the bubble of God's grace. You are forgiven. Come judgment day, you're going to declare it innocent, okay? Just don't quit, okay? Keep growing, all right? Keep learning God's ways. Keep learning to put them. If you mess up, just humbly ask God for forgiveness. His forgiveness is going to be there for you. All right? And, and if you mess, you know, you hurt somebody with your sin, you know, ask them for forgiveness. If there's something you can do to show them that you're sorry for what you did, show them in your works, in what you do, that you're genuinely sorry for how you may have sinned against them, how you may have done something wrong to them. But just don't quit. Just don't give up on your faith and go back to unbelief and go back to that philosophy of I'm going to do what I want as opposed to what God wants. And God's grace will remain with you throughout the rest of your days. You cannot save yourself, okay? If you were to live perfect from this moment forward, there are still things you've done in your past for which that there must be punishment. There must be justice. So please, I am begging you, choose the gift that Jesus and the and God are offering you. Choose to be saved. Choose to be forgiven. Choose to follow them. And not only will you escape punishment come judgment day, there is an eternal life in paradise with them awaiting for you. Please, if you have any questions, throw them in the comments and just any way I can be of help to you. Uh, please try and reach out to me. Um, reach out to other people who you know have made this choice. And may God guide you home to be with him. Thank you for listening.